The Graduate Institute at St. John's College explores the great books of the West or the East. Now online or in person at our Annapolis, Maryland, or Santa Fe, New Mexico campuses. Learn more at sjc.edu. Welcome to the Harper's Podcast. I'm your host, Violet Luca. In the January 2005 issue of Harper's Magazine, in an article arguing for a secular Jewish state, Bernard Avishai wrote, quote, Nearly everyone here will tell you that they see Israel as Jewish and democratic. Almost nobody can tell you what this means, end quote. Eighteen years later, that ambiguity has faded. Widespread protests have erupted across the country in the name of Israel's High Court of Justice, the institution that most Israelis view as integral to its democracy, as well as a safeguard against prosecution by external courts. Changes proposed by the ruling coalition, which is composed of right-wing and ultra-right-wing parties, would significantly weaken the Supreme Court's power and essentially put it under the control of the ruling coalition. It's a move that even Alan Dershowitz has criticized. Alan Dershowitz. Bernard Avishai joined me to discuss the state of the Israeli left, the demographic and cultural differences that have shaped the country's politics, and other recent events that have stoked controversy from outside and within the country. I will note that if you're familiar with the history of Zionism and the foundation of Israel, you may want to skip to the second question I asked Bernard, which starts roughly at 2208. So on January 4th of this year, the justice minister that Benjamin Netanyahu had appointed announced uh, changes, proposed changes to Israel's judiciary. And this is something that's been called the, the Supreme Court override bill. And these changes include uh, the governing coalition would be granted a majority on the committee that appoints judges, which as an American sounds familiar. Uh, this would limit the Supreme Court's ability to strike down legislation, which mm. comes from the Knesset, or to rule against the executive. And also the executive branch, you know, again, mm -hmm. the ruling coalition would get the decisive upper hand against the judiciary branch. So, you know, you've written a lot of things for Harper's about, um, you know, Net Netanyahu's changes to the country. Um, to what extent has this, these changes, which right. are quite sweeping, to what extent has, has, have these changes been accelerating? Or are they just part of the course that Likud and Netanyahu's government was always on? The Likud should not be confused with this coalition as a whole. Historically, the Likud has been um, a kind of reactionary party, right-wing party, but it had some classical liberals in it. Most of them have been swept away, and the ones who haven't uh, have certainly been swept away by this uh, so-called judicial reform, which is really an assault on the judiciary and an effort to make the judiciary uh, um, a um, subordinate institution to the government and its majority in the parliament in the Knesset. Um, there's a larger coalition here, and it includes, um, most importantly, a group that we generally call religious Zionists, who have always had in mind that Israel should be a theocracy where Orthodox Jewish law should basically be the constitution of the country. They were a much smaller group before. They've been growing over the years, and they've also been encouraged by sort of the messianic resonances of the occupation. There's also a Haredi group, a so-called ultra-Orthodox group in this coalition, who love the idea of a theocracy, but are also trying to protect the particular privileges that they've gained over the years that allow their young men to study without having to go to the army and give them a, a, a government funded uh, separate school system where mostly they're getting religious education and are not learning English, are not learning math, are not being prepared at all for the workforce. Um, 
And then you have another group in the coalition, so-called Shas, which is a kind of um, party of Mizrahi, that is to say, North African, largely uh, Jews, who've been the, traditionally the most ill-educated in the country um, and the poorest, and are susceptible to these populist appeals, um, particularly the appeal that says the Supreme Court is this Ashkenazi European elite shoving liberalism down their throats um, and uh, mm. giving them a kind of model for how to be in the country, uh, which is inconsistent with the rather conservative traditionalist homes that they have been um, accustomed to. So these three groups together, along with the rump of the Likud, which has become a kind of cult of personality for, uh, for Bibi Netanyahu, this, 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 these three groups plus the rump of the Likud have created a coalition who are trying to uh, basically destroy the judiciary. But it's important to understand why it's so important for them to destroy the judiciary. Because um, partly Netanyahu is under indictment, and this is the thing you hear all the time. He's under indictment. He's trying to undermine the people, the institutions that are likely to put him in prison. That's all true, but it's a half truth and not the more interesting half. What is really going on here is sort of the culmination of a culture war that's been going on really since the state was founded. And uh, the uh, Supreme Court has been an effort to overturn those aspects of the state apparatus that have been theocratic from the beginning. Um, you, you, have to, you have to think of Israel in this sense, a little like Quebec in the 1950s, where the church ran the educational mm. system and the church ran the social services. You know, if you went to school in Quebec and were learning in French, you were basically being taught by a nun or a priest. That, that was the world of Quebec. And the quiet revolution of the 1960s tried to overturn this ultramontane church ambiance and introduce liberal values, liberal norms in a world where liberalism was not enshrined or, or sort of baked into the constitutional life of the province of Quebec. And, and you had people like René Lévesque, you had people like Pierre Trudeau and, and uh, uh, Marchand and others who were part of this world that was trying to Take, take the stranglehold of the church off the population. The, the Supreme Court in Israel has been in some sense that. Since 1992, uh, the Supreme Court has begun to overturn series of laws which have been inconsistent with what we think of liberal norms. Why is 1992 so important? Because in 1992, a basic law was introduced. And that basic law said, the so-called law of human dignity and liberty, the basic law said that mm -hmm. um, individuals have, have an irreducible dignity. The court has interpret that to be, interpreted that to be a, um, a kind of bill of rights and have started to overturn laws inconsistent with that bill of rights. Why is that important? Because Israel has no constitution, never had a constitution. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, in a country without a constitution, with residual theocratic privileges that had really been imported from the time of the British mandate, Israel is a place where there's no civil law, a civil marriage, uh, a place where... Um, you have a separate religious school system, no separation of religion and state, uh, a place where the law of return gives privileges to people who are legally defined as Jews. And increasingly that meant Jewish by Jewish law. 
that would be interpreted by a rabbinic mm -hmm. court, not by the uh, the state. Um, Israel's a place where ninety over ninety percent of the land was held by the Israel Land Authority and privileged Jews, again, legal Jews. How was the Jew going to be defined? Again, it was through um, a, a conception of, of uh, Jewish that was theocratic. And that was um, always residual to what was imported from the mandate. No constitution, along comes the law of human dignity. Which, which was pushed by liberals who were, you know, part of this globalizing Tel Aviv world. They, they thought it was time for the country to begin to normalize its liberal democratic traditions. And um, the court basically was trying to create a kind of cultural revolution like Levesque and Trudeau were trying to create in Quebec. In order to stop that, you had to disempower the judiciary. So you really have this, this culture war going on. And um, the, the, uh, probably the, 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 the question that arises then is, well, if all of these residual, residual theocratic institutions were in the country, where did the secularism come from? And yeah. uh, that sort of begs the question of how Israel was founded in the first place. The irony is, the irony is, is that the original founding Zionist movement was an enormously secular movement. Bunch Socialists, of socialists. Liberals. <laughs> people who were uh, much influenced by the Enlightenment, they thought that what they were building was a kind of Hebrew democracy, a kind of Hebrew republic that was going to be an alternative to a rabbinic world that they thought could not survive modernity. And hmm. before they ever worried about would there be a state back in the 19 teens and 20s and 30s before they began to really you know uh, preoccupy themselves whether israel would be a state they questioned whether the jews could become a nation and the way they could become a nation they thought was through the incubation of the hebrew language and in some sense, the socialism that was so much a part of the original labor Zionist ideal was an effort to create institutions that would incubate through economic autarky and self-sufficiency, a Hebrew language that would give birth to a modern Hebrew nation that could be a Hebrew democratic country. That, those were the founding principles, the theocracy that was residual to the Israeli state was really imported from the mandate period. And um, the, 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 British, the British recognized the rabbinate as having, say, responsibility for marriage in the same way that they recognized the Mufti of Jerusalem as having responsibility. They wanted to kind of divide and rule. They wanted to, to uh, think about the two communities merely as religious communities where they were the government. But that's not how the Zionists looked at it. And the Zionists really didn't pay much attention to what the religious Zionists, the religious, uh, the, the, the rabbinate was doing. Most people got married without the rabbinate. They didn't care what the rabbis were doing or not doing. But when the state was founded, there were these residual theocratic institutions that um, the uh, labor Zionists basically tolerated. And You know, I'm sorry, Violet, it just occurred to me, you know, I've, I've said this, I've basically told you the whole story backwards. And I'm happy. 
No, it's a good, it, I think it's helpful to tell okay. the story backwards sometimes. Um, so the key is that the founding generation in Israel, the founding Zionist generation was secular. It was socialist, social democratic. It never doubted for a second that Israel would be something like a Hebrew Republic. It had in fact created a constitution that was supposed to be enacted in 1949. The first Knesset was actually not supposed to be a parliament. It was supposed to be a constitutional convention. There was a, there was mm. a uh, constitution already written and the residual theocratic institutions in the country would have been in effect retired by this constitution in 1949. And the question then became, why was it not retired? Why were these, why, why was the theocracy not retired in, in 1949? Why was there not a constitution? The answer is that when Ben-Gurion came to power in 49, he lacked a majority in that constitutional convention. His, his party, his social democratic party had 46 seats out of 120. He had to get to 61. And in order to get to 61, he had a choice. He could have taken the 20 people on the extreme left, some of whom were very resentful of him for reasons that are not worth going into now, but mo more important, many of whom were Stalinists and he didn't, and he knew, Ben-Gurion knew that he had to open Israel up to the West, to international investment, particularly by American Jews. And it would be inappropriate mm. to have in the government Stalinists at the height of the Cold War. Um, right. The other people he could have gone with, who would have, like the people on the left, been willing to enact a constitution, uh, were the extreme right, that is Begin and the so-called Cheruk party, but they had been, according to Ben-Gurion, fascist terrorists. And he did not want to make a deal with them and bring them into the government, largely because what they were going to be militating for was the, was the uh, um, disruption and uh, undermining of the socialist state. Israel in, 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 the in 1949, the, the Histadrut, the labor union owned about 50% of the enterprises. The state was uh, very active in creating new uh, state capitalist institutions. They would not be partners in that. Um, he also knew that he wanted to get reparations from the Germans and they would not be partners for that. So he was left with these 10 seats that he had to fill to get to 61 and the religious Zionists who were puny in 1949, the religious Zionists basically said, okay, I'll join you. I'm not gonna interfere with anything you do with regard to social development, economic development, diplomacy, anything else. You build the army, you do the foreign policy, do anything you want, just keep our privileges. Just don't disrupt the religious status quo. We now have control over marriage and divorce and burial. Don't disrupt that. We have our own separate school system. Don't disrupt that. And moreover, some of the ultra-Orthodox came to him in 1954 and said, we also have a school system and we don't want to go to the army. And at the time, we were talking about 400 people, 400 people. Right. Right now, the ultra-Orthodox young people who don't go to the army number about 110,000. So, you know, it's important the DNA that you set down, it's going to have a lot to do with the kind of problems you face later. So again, try, just try to kind of see the political map here. You have these theocrats who have been growing um, 
partly through simple demographic facts. They have very big families and so on. The theocrats have been growing and they have a series of institutions that they want to protect from a Supreme Court that wants to overturn them for the sake of extending liberal democracy in the country, human rights. Mm -hmm. And you have, on the other hand, a large right. secular uh, society, which had been, you know, the sons, grandsons and granddaughters, sons, daughters, grandsons and granddaughters of the founding generation, who've now become part of a kind of global world system, entrepreneurial, startup nation, um, highly educated, highly scientific, highly uh, idiosyncratic and cosmopolitan in their cultural lives. And uh, they're largely concentrated in Tel Aviv, where the religious Zionists and the Haredim mm -hmm. and so on are concentrated in Jerusalem. And what you really have is this friction between greater Israel, that is the religious Zionists and their occupation, their desire to settle the West Bank and, and you know, live the messianic dream, which is not just the settling of the West Bank, but the colonization of the government, the colonization of the state apparatus. Mm. They want that. And then you have, so you have greater Israel in Jerusalem, you have this global Israel in Tel Aviv. And global Israel is absolutely behind the Supreme Court because they're like Levesque and Trudeau trying to um, open up the society and, and, and uh, suppress the, um, the uh, uh, theocratic elements that had been imported into the state and, and were uh, undermining the liberal norms of the state. What you've laid out kind of you, is it's evident, obviously it's evident in a lot of things, not just sort of this push against the um, Supreme Court, but, you know, in terms of Netanyahu, and I'm going to switch between saying Netanyahu and Netanyahu okay. because I feel like it. Um, and Netanyahu is the longest tenured prime minister in the history of Israel. And he's he's served for over a, a, over a total of 15 years. So, you know, and he he seems to follow this pattern of, you know, getting elected, just sort of barely forming a coalition dissolving the Knesset and then staying in power while the government attempts to reform itself. And it's just sort of this, this weird holding pattern. Right. Um, and I have to ask, you know, it, it, considering how important democracy, democracy is to, let's say non ultra Orthodox uh, Israelis, how is that democratic? Like, is it that also a sign that something is perhaps flawed with this democracy? So that's a really interesting question, because um, obviously one has to ask, why now? Like, why did it take a, an effort to do away with the Supreme Court to bring out from people who have uh, fundamentally secular and liberal ideas and norms, why did it take so long for them to finally act in this culture war with this kind of ferocity? Um, it's actually a wonderful question because if you think about this religious Zionist virus getting um, kind of planted back in 1949, where were the antibodies? And uh, it is the case that people who had liberal instincts uh, from the 40s on, it is the case that the appeal to religious authenticity, the appeal to tolerating, even coddling rabbinical forces that seemed um, 
you know, well, they're not going to survive modernity anyway, but let's respect them. They kind of remind me of my grandfather. Um, they, <laughs> they claim an authenticity that I can't really gainsay. And then came the 67 war and the occupation and reuniting of Jerusalem. And you even had people like Golda Meir who was an American from Milwaukee who was absolutely committed to a secular and democratic ethos, becoming very sentimental about messianic ideas and, and uh, feeling that you know, Jerusalem, this, this holy city, I mean, Jews actually never had a notion of a holy place. It was, it was always a metaphor. Uh, the Messiah was always tarrying, you know, the, 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 the Messiah would never come. Um, there, there was always this traditional understanding of uh, diaspora Jews that was um, so much uh, so skeptical of um, holy land, holy writ. Everything was up for interpretation. Everything was up for debate. Um, my wife just wrote a book about uh, Jerusalem called Figuring Jerusalem, in which she quotes Maimonides, the famous um, uh, 12th century a uh, uh, scholar who, um, actually 12th century, I'm trying to remember, he actually lived into the 1100s, but in any case, he, he, he wrote in the Guide of the Perplexed his famous um, book that you can be no closer to God in the seventh or the ninth circle of heaven than you can be in anywhere in the world. You, there's, there's no way that the God who is ubiquitous um, is somehow closer to you because you're in any particular space. This was part of you know, diaspora Judaism from the beginning, but here comes 1967. There's this land, there's this temple mount, there's this sense of having almost been wiped off the map, which people really felt was possible in the lead up to the 67 war. And there was this sense of triumphal um, uh, regaining of space that the religious Zionists were saying was holy. And here's Golda Meir being unable to do anything but kind of go along with it. Um, so you have these people with liberal values and liberal ideas, nevertheless, um, kind of being sort of conning themselves with, with messianic ideas. Um, and they never thought that it would ever undermine their lives. <laughs> you know, at worst, it was going to provide um, a kind of rationale for the settlers to go and occupy parts of the West Bank, which was, some of them thought, you know, disputed territory because you had uh, no real partner anyway. And so why not um, go along with this uh, ideological fuzziness? Um, this, this is uh, ending now. It's changing now. The, the, the liberal democratic forces in Israel finally realize that they need a constitution, they need a bill of rights, they need to stop being sentimental about um, religious Zionist uh, uh, appeals. Um, and we are seeing a kind of culture war that's um, really coming to a head. Uh, we, you know, our side may lose, the side of liberal Democrats may lose, but at least we're clear in our heads again. We finally have the antibodies against this. We finally realize 
that mm -hmm. that there's a difference be, that if that if you want to have a Jewish state that's a democratic state, it has to be a kind of Hebrew republic. Uh, uh, it has to be a state that defines Jewish as a linguistic cultural world which anyone can assimilate into, including a 20% Arab minority can assimilate into, not be overwhelmed by, not give up Arabic, not give up their own world. Don't forget they're surrounded by 100 million Arabs. So it's not like they're going to, um, through assimilating into this Hebrew civil society, give up what is precious to them culturally. But it is nevertheless, a kind of Hebrew citizenship that they're gaining. That is something that the original Zionists anticipated, built, and offer them today. But the uh, theocratic Jewish state, as opposed to this Hebrew democracy, is in control of the Knesset right now. And uh, it's not at all clear that they're going to lose. They, you know, by the summer, they could enact their entire package. Yes, I believe one minister stated as such, like, we're going to get this done by the end of the month. Um, and, you know, what's what's been remarkable about seeing these protests is that, you know, military reservists have refused to train uh, in protest. Um, Allegedly, there were IDF pilots refusing to fly the Netanyahu's to Rome. And I mention this because Netanyahu's relationship with overtly right-wing heads of state is something that's been kind of consistent throughout his his tenure, right? Like, you know, he met with Giorgia Maloney, who is an actual fascist, and said, you know, Israel's relationship with Italy will be greatly expanded. You know, he's, you know, he's palled around with Viktor Orban, uh, the prime minister of Lithuania, yeah. you know, a country that has been pushing to this revisionist history of the Holocaust and right, of right. World War II. Um, and, you know, are these alliances, you know, his kind of, his willing to not just sort of dance with these people, but be kind of friendly with them in this in this odd way, are, are these alliances reflective of his desire for greater control in Israel or does it reflect something darker, which is that perhaps Israel will gain Jewish citizens if anti-Semitism increases worldwide? Um, I don't. I don't think it's quite that um, Machiavellian and manipulative that somehow if he pals around with anti-Semites, we're going to gain refugees from anti-Semitism. Um, I do think that. Uh, he's comfortable with them because he shares um, a fundamental, almost Steve Bannon-ish idea of what a state is. I mean, you know, in some sense, Netanyahu is, is a self-described um, political ideologue who's conception of the state is very close to Mussolini's, you know? I mean, he said again and again, only the strong survive, history doesn't favor the weak. Um, I've heard him give this talk, you know, a dozen times, history doesn't favor the weak. How are you strong? To be strong, you have to have a very strong military and you have to have tremendous national solidarity. Um, your military, your solidarity is your resilience. How can you afford a strong military? You need to be a rich country. How can you be a rich country? You need to have market relations, unrestricted market relations that allows the uh, country to prosper. Um, and if the country prospers, therefore you can have the greatest military equipment, that you can afford the best equipment and your science will produce the best equipment. This is, this is his conception of the state of Israel and has been really for as long as he's had a political career. He got a lot of it from his father, an historian, uh, Ben Zion Netanyahu. Um, what's 
interesting and even ironic about the current situation is that he says to be strong, you need a strong military. And to have a strong military, you need a strong economy. The leaders of the military and the leaders of the economy are absolutely against him. Um, the, the military leadership uh, recognize that the strength of the military is in the willingness of young people to sacrifice. And they're not going to sacrifice for a dictatorship. Ehud Barak uh, gave a talk, the former prime minister and former chief of staff, uh, of the army gave a talk in Tel Aviv a couple of weeks ago, which I attended, in which he brought people to their feet um, saying, you know, we did not bury our brothers to defend a dictatorship of, of, of ben, Benjamin Netanyahu and his cult of personality. That is not why we die. Um, and uh, said, you know, in the army, in every officer training program, the officer is taught that any order that you get under a black flag, i.e. an illegal order, any order you get under a black flag, it's not your privilege to refuse. It's your duty to refuse. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he said, uh, look back in history, you know, people who follow orders and dictatorships don't exactly have great reputations as opposed to people who refuse orders in dictatorships. He really brought people to his feet. And I have to say, part of what brought people to their feet, including myself, was this feeling that we may have um, a need for physical courage in this culture war. It could become violent and um, almost certainly will become violent. And we're going to need leaders who can inspire us uh, to, to sacrifice for this democratic ideal. Um, the other thing is the economy. You know, how, how uh, do you have a strong economy? Well, you have to have scientific freedom. Israel, Israel is mining oil. Israel is mining intellectual prowess, um, mining scientific imagination mining scientific precision and scientific doubt, freedom of conscience, freedom of, uh, freedom of empathy. I mean, how do, you, how do you create a business? Israel has thousands of startups. How do you create a business if you don't have empathy for people where you're solving a problem no one else thought of? You're solving their problems in ways that no one else had thought of. The, 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 the magic of the Israeli entrepreneurial economy is the cosmopolitan freedoms that Israelis have cultivated over the years, particularly in the Tel, in Tel Aviv and Haifa along the coast. Israel also has a coast, you know, like, like America. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if you take that away, people are going to run they're, they're not going to start businesses. They're, there's already been a clear change. Young people are not registering since this so-called judicial reform. They, they're not registering their businesses in Israel. They're registering them in Delaware. They're not, they're, they're, <laughs> they're taking money out. There are international companies that are putting their development plans and investments in Israel on hold. Most of the capital that comes to Israel comes from American sources and European sources. It's a venture capital. Israel's the venture capital, uh, other than Silicon Valley, it's the venture capital center of the world. And, uh, and that's stopping because you can't have entrepreneurial energy and entrepreneurial genius in the absence of liberal freedom that's and by the way they don't want to raise their kids young people who are thinking about starting these companies don't want to raise their kids if their kids are going to have um you know talk of a th building a third temple in jerusalem shoved down their their throats or if they can't 
go to the beach on, on the Sabbath, or if the beaches are suddenly going to be restricted so that only men and there's men's beaches and women's beaches or men's buses and women's buses. If that, you know, if, if, if Israel starts to look like Iran or a little Jewish Pakistan, this is not going to be a place where the best people are going to want to create their businesses and build their lives. And a moment ago, you mentioned sort of the the need for strong leadership. And I think in the U.S., uh, we, we don't tend to hear about the Israeli left. So, so, so how would you describe the state of, how would you appraise the state of the Israeli left? Like, is because again, this is clearly a large cross section of society that is coming out against uh, against these judicial reforms, but also uh, the left. The left is not the same as like the center or center left, right? How do I think about the left? How how is it led? You mean? I mean, how it, it, does it have? I mean, before this, was it strong? Like that, you know, appraising its health, appraising the you know like the viability of its leaders because again it, it like leaving aside these demographic mm-hmm. issues how is it you know in terms of participating in the discourse leading the discourse in israel because again with the, those sorts of things just don't come over here at all the problem with the israeli left is that it has been so focused on the arab israeli conflict so focused on solving the um, problem of relations with Palestine, ending the occupation and so forth, that it has been distracted from the problem of democracy itself. And as I said before, the Israeli left and what might be called the Israeli center has kind of lack the antibodies against all this Jewish sentimentalism, this Orthodox Jewish sentimentalism. Um, So that you hear things in the Israeli left like, well, we're a democracy as long as we're a Jewish majority. And there was all this talk about a demographic problem. We have a demographic problem. We, you know, we're not going to be a Jewish state if we uh, swallow uh, 5 million people in occupied territory. Um, that that kind of talk has been going on in the Israeli left, and it's it's kind of rattled around in the discourse on the Israeli left for so long that there hasn't been a clear focus on constitutional reform, protection of the judiciary, a bill of rights, and slowly doing away with something like the law of return, which, you know, if you're a Jew from Teaneck, you can land in Israel, become a citizen immediately. Um, Whereas if you're an Arab living in Israel your whole life, and by the way, speak Hebrew 50 times better than someone coming from Teaneck, um, you know, you can't bring your wife from Jordan. So that, those anomalies, the the problem of of the Israel land authority and the particular privileges that are given to Jews as opposed to non-Jews in the country, all of these things, which the Supreme Court has gingerly tried to address, the, the Israeli left has not really focused on these things, but I believe now you're going to have all of these things cropping up on the agenda. But I think you're asking something else. Where is the leadership? Is there a leadership? And the problem has been that because the Palestinian issue has sort of defined what the Israeli left was, you had the emergence on the Israeli left of two groups. One, which is, I would say, completely committed, a smaller group, maybe 10% of the population, completely committed to ending the occupation and so on. Then you had another like 40% of the population. I'm talking about the whole Israeli population committed to 
um, a two-state solution in some form, in some form, but not at all sure that there was a partner. And then you had swing voters who are kind of secular um, and are represented by something called the Israeli Center, who also have a lot of representation in that 40%. Um, the swing voters who say, well, um, we're, we're in favor of a, a liberal Israel, but we, you know, we're going to focus on the economy. We're going to focus on um, some sort of bourgeois uh, satisfactions, but we're not going to really uh, look at the Palestinian situation because the, the Palestinians are not ready for the kind of uh, the kind of world that we want to build here. Um, and so, you know, the Israeli center left is this hodgepodge. The people who have emerged in the Israeli center over the last uh, 10, 15 years, which I actually wrote about in Harper's back in 2015, the, the people who have emerged in, in the Israeli center are really people who say, well, I'm not like those leftists who think that the Palestinians are, you know, okay. I'm not like them. I'm not, I don't believe that, oh, we'll give them their land and maybe we'll, they'll leave us alone. You know, that I'm not like, I'm not naive like that. I don't want missiles at Ben Gurion Airport. I don't want, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't trust the other side. So, so I'm not naive, right? And then they turn around and say, but on the other hand, I'm not like a settler. I'm not like crazy. I'm not messianic. I'm not, and, and this is sort of what the Israeli left has been led by. Um, right now, those centrists, I'm talking to Yair Lapid, Benny Gantz, th those centrists are being pushed into a focus on the constitutional crisis in the country in a way that they had never been before. And I can't honestly say I know whether they're going to emerge as the leadership of this opposition movement. They are the leaders in the Knesset, um, but their parties weren't built on this. I have a feeling that we're about to see the emergence of a grassroots Democratic Party in Israel. I don't know who its leaders will be, but I suspect they're going to emerge from the young leadership that is organizing these protests. In the it started in various cities and are um, names that none of us would immediately recognize. I mean, one of the people you see again and again right now is. Um, this uh, satirist, the name is uh, Lior Schlein, who's sort of like uh, Israel's John Stewart, who happens to be the partner of the head of the Labour Party, but leave that aside. He's he's got a, a an independent um, independent profile politically, but people like that. He's in his forties. He's brilliant, completely committed to a liberal democratic Israel. Tel Aviv to his bones. Um, people like that are going to emerge in a new configuration. And uh, whether they swallow up the center parties or agree to be led by them, I, I can't say. But there is definitely a, a grassroots movement forming, which is going to ultimately have political consequences. So I have to mention something I mean, obviously, there's. I think you make a great point that there's more to living in a country than its, you know, supposedly biggest problem. Like Americans, uh, with with few, ex there are certain exceptions, obviously, but Americans don't go around thinking, "Oh my God, we own guns. <laughs> Anyone can own a gun." Like people, people don't do it. You know, they're they're living their life. You know, they have to get their hair done, like Sarah Netanyahu. Uh, but they're, you know, so people. This this is not forefront on people's minds and so the, there's definitely this need to address you know other issues and sort of center politics around other uh con sort of concrete uh aspects of life social life political life e economic life um 
But I do have to mention something that happened recently, which is that Bezazel's Smotrich, who's uh, the Israeli yeah. finance minister, and he yeah. also serves in the yeah. defense yeah. ministry, uh, he, he said this he right. said this awful thing, right. uh, which was that, quote, I think right. war needs to be wiped out. I think the state of Israel should do it. The job shouldn't right. be done by, you know. Yeah. Uh, and this is something that, you know, the U.S. State Department condemned. Um, and Smotrich has just sort of kind of mm -hmm. walking mm -hmm. it back. Uh, you know, he said he used the term like soul searching in a Facebook post. Like it's just sort of the worst, <laughs> the worst yeah. sort of the cliche is about so you yeah. say something yeah. awful and you don't actually mean yeah. that you're sorry. Um, and Netanyahu took several days to condemn this right. statement. Um, to what extent has this an energized or sort of recentered that issue for Israelis? Because again, this is this is somebody who has uh, enormous. Um, He's a, he's a huge part of the government. Like he's he's front and center, and he's saying this stuff that otherwise, you know, uh, kind of lowly extremists would would say. You mean recentered the Palestinian issue, or I mean, recentered the Palestinian issue as well as kind of like uh, shown that these things go hand in hand. That the that the curtailing of democracy and what is being you know the this this uh, genocidal approach to Palestinians, they kind of go hand in hand. But there's this unpleasant well, the, truth. The, the head that... of the military administration in the West Bank called what happened in Huara a pogrom. And this for Zionists particularly, people who have any understanding of Zionist history, which is a lot of people in the country, they don't have a detailed appreciation of Zionism, but they have a kind of vaguely detailed understanding of how Zionism started. They know that Zionism really started with the pogrom of 1881 in Russia. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened in Hawara is when it's called a pogrom by the head of the military administration, everybody knows that we have suddenly lost the moral authority to take satisfaction in our own history. Um, we are capable of pogroms the same way pogroms were done against us. And by the way, these are the people who inflict pogroms on people. You know, these religious Zionists, these settlers are the ones who inflict the pogroms on people. If you were part of the religious Zionist community to begin with, most of the focus is going to be on uh, the murder of these two young boys who were killed in Khawar. Just like in sort of reactionary Russia, uh, people were focused on the assassination of Tsar Alexander II as the reason that justified the pogroms. Um, right. But for the liberals in the country, this event, this horror in Huara, where scores of, of uh, homes were set on fire and, and and cars were set on fire and a, and a young man was killed. Um, this, this was a horror that degraded the sense of patriotism that Jews have, identifying with the historic Zionist movement and the reasons why it was necessary. Um, as far as Smutrich is concerned, um, you know, it's interesting the way he put it, right? He said, you can't take the law into your own hands. If we're going to wipe out a city, the state should do it and not individual settlers. But at some yes, level, yes. that registered with the, with, the, uh, with the extreme right in the country as being a kind of revelation of something that people on the extreme right are never willing to completely admit, 
that what they really want in the end is is a kind of uh, uh, ethnic cleansing of the West Bank so that the Palestinians will leave the West Bank, create a Palestinian state in the Jordanian territory in this kingdom of Jordan, basically take down the king and have, um, you know, a, uh, and that they would have, the, the Israelis would have, i.e. the religious Zionists would have a unified land of Israel, which was the dream palace that they had imagined in the first place. I'm talking the religious Zionists, not the secular Zionists, who are probably the majority mm. still in the country. The religious Zionists, this, this is their hope. And the tensions now that are being fomented between Israel and the Palestinians in a way play into their hands. Um, every time there's a tit for tat where some terrorist uh, kills a bunch of people and the army moves in and tries to root out the cell that the terrorist was living in and winds up not just killing the perpetrator of the terror, but also sort of everyone else in the cell. And if there are two or three innocent bystanders, so be it. You know, that, that tit for tat that's been going on where the tat is in some sense preemptive increasingly, um, mm. that is playing into the hands of Smutrich because the democratic forces are trying to rally, mobilize um, Democrats a lot, you know, throughout the country against the government and the smootriches of Israel are trying to mobilize the country against the Palestinians. And you have this triangular system of violence. Um, and right now, unfortunately, both sides seem to be succeeding. Um, it's not it's not clear that this triangle is going to be decided by one side sort of by one side winning and the other side sort of throwing up their hands. It it feels it feels different right now. The 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 um, the grief people feel at the time of a terrorist attack is real. The media will pay a great deal of attention to that grief, as you would expect. Uh, and there have been two demonstrations I've gone to in the last six weeks where the first five minutes were devoted to sharing uh, grief with the families of the people who've been killed in the terrorist attack, as if apologizing for coming out in favor of democracy when you have these terrorists uh, who are clearly themselves by no means sympathetic to democratic norms, um, acting against Jews, even if they're Jews living where they shouldn't be living in the territories. Uh, th there's there, there's a kind of tension that it's very, very hard to resolve. And uh, in some ways there's a rivalry now. There's a, there's a kind of competition between what violence is going to be um, more effective. Like, will it be, will it be the, 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 Maybe violence isn't the right word. What force is going to be more effective? Will it be the force of the demonstrations against the government or will it be the centripetal force of the government against the Palestinians? That is really not clear right now. And I have to, I realize this just happened today like very very yeah. brand new news but uh speaking of wars you know the saudis uh who have been normalizing relations with uh, israel have announced that they're normalizing relations yeah. with iran 
which probably yeah. means that the war in Yemen is reaching right. some sort of conclusion. How how do you feel this as uh, you know is this going is this move going to empower the right and the ultra right wing or is it something that is uh, just uh, how would I say maybe more important things are happening at the moment because obviously you know as you said Israel has a coast uh, Iran has you know control of those waterways etc so. For Netanyahu, normalization of relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran is a nightmare. He was hoping to go out and shoot this big buffalo and drag it back to the cave. He was hoping that in spite of everything going on with the judiciary, he would be able to create some kind of special relationship with, uh, with, with the Saudi leadership and um, give people a sense that, well, say what you want about him, you know, say how much you hate dictators, etc. Look, this is a guy who gets things done. Like this is a guy who brings home mm -hmm the bacon, if you'll excuse the expression with regard to Israel and Saudi Arabia. Um, <laughs> what uh, is interesting is that the Abraham Accords, which Netanyahu had a lot to do with consummating, he didn't start the process that led to the Abraham Accords. That was started under Ehud Olmert before him. But the, the special relationship that was evolving between Israel and the Emirates um, and the uh, political economic integration that was uh, portended by the Abraham Accords was something that the democratic forces in the country were actually benefiting from. Because, first of all, the Emirates were saying, you know, you annex the West Bank and the deal's off. So that's that's good. But it's also... Beyond that, it's, wow, we are not just a villa in a jungle, like beyond the shrubbery in this part of the jungle, wow, there's an even bigger, more beautiful villa, you know, that we can uh, work with. And um, we have the opportunity to uh, normalize our relations with the Arab world as a whole. Um, why would we screw that up? by worrying about whether Jews can go to the tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron um, and, and call it sovereign Jewish territory when we could go to the tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron uh, that might be under uh, the sovereignty of a Palestinian government in confederation with Israel. That's the other side of it, the, the social and economic integration that Israel is talking about with regard to the Emirates has a kind of local, um, local uh, possibility, which is a confederation with uh, Palestine, a confederation that would be a kind of common market also with Jordan. That all looks so plausible and it gives the liberals in the country, something to talk about other than a vague two-state solution, which sounds like separating, you know, two territories that are as close as uh, Kennedy Airport is from Newark Airport. You know, the, the idea that somehow you can mm -hmm. create a, uh, just a separate state uh, it, it was clearly absurd. So how do you create an integration well, the Abraham Accords show that if it can be done regionally, it can certainly be done locally. If you can create a common market, something like a common market with the Emirates, like a free trade agreement with the Emirates, wow, I mean, you can also create so much with this population next door, which, you know, if you just take Israel-Palestine together, north of the Negev Desert, Israel-Palestine together, you're basically the size of Los Angeles, you know, so the, the idea that that could happen is, is, 
is something that the Abraham Accords have given a boost to. Uh, and ironically, it was Netanyahu who brought this to the country, but it, it's actually empowered the people now in the opposition. Saudi Arabia is a different thing. If he would have been able to bring the Saudis into a strategic relationship with Israel and um, continue a path toward something like bombing the Iranian nuclear facilities, believing that the Saudis and the Emirates and the Americans were all vaguely having his back. Um, if he could do that, it would be very hard to um, discredit his leadership. That feels no longer a problem. If the Saudis and the Iranians are making that kind of deal, it may be not just a question of Yemen. There may also be some kind of agreement with regard to nuclear weapons. I don't think the, the, the Saudis want to initiate a nuclear weapons program, but the Iranians are like one step away from nuclear weapons. They've been enriching uranium. They're one step away from nuclear weapons. Maybe this will create a, a kind of momentum towards um, status quo, keeping the status quo and not, not going to a nuclear breakout. Um, that's, that, that's based as much on dread and wishful thinking as it is on evidence. I just want to be clear about that. But that's something we can at least mm -hmm. hope for. And then finally, I wanted to, you know, you mentioned your piece from mm -hmm. 2015, which, you know, reading it in preparation for this, I was shocked at how prescient it was. Like, I think of if you, you know, save for certain events that have transpired, you would, it, it feels very contemporary. Um, and in it, you talk about, you know, the Israeli rights uh, approach, the, how they kind of copy Republican strategy where, you know, well, all government is bad, so why bother with government at all? And obviously the, the right wings in, the, in America, the right wings uh, approach has changed slightly, but uh, has, has Israel's right sort of, you know, been copying the test answers of the Republican Party? Like obviously uh, Netanyahu and Trump are great buddies that have been since the 80s, but there, is there sort of this larger, has there been this shift towards perhaps more conspiratorial thinking toward sort of the worst impulses of uh, conservatives in the United States? See, again, the Israeli right has been a ward of the state. The Israeli right counts on the state apparatus to support its school systems, to pay for its settlement architecture, uh, to defend and provide security for its settlement project, um, to pay for people who are supervising kashrut and people who are performing weddings and you know granting divorces. The state apparatus has been fundamentally important to the Israeli, the so-called Israeli right wing. Ironically, it's the left in Israel, which is the rich, powerful elites. <laughs> they're, they're actually They elites. actually are elites, <laughs> right. They're, they are the elites. They're, they're, um, they're people who have started businesses. They're people who have um, had extremely lucrative exits you know, mobilize selling to Intel for billions of dollars and so on, Waze selling to Google. Um, these are uh, young people who've made fortunes and um, they're, they're not like the American right wing. Um, but Israel altogether has a different conception of uh, government than Americans. It, it has a socialist past. 
it's a socialist past that has been transformed by global enterprise, global investment, and uh, all kinds of incentives to start businesses, business development, business uh, startups in Israel is, as I said before, extraordinary. Um, but that doesn't mean that they don't think the government's important. They, you know, Israel has uh, a medical system, which uh, ironically was instituted the same year that uh, the Clinton health plan was torpedoed in the Senate by the Republicans. Well, the Israeli health system, building on its socialist past, the Israeli health system is almost a copy of the Clinton health plan of 1994 and has been oh. incredibly successful. Israel's health system um, is uh, something like 7.8% of the GDP to America's like 18, 19% of GDP and its health outcomes are better it's health outcomes and people live in Israel uh, four years longer than Americans do. Um, yeah, it's, huh? most, <laughs> it's most places it's abominable, but yes. No, it's quite <laughs> remarkable. Israel basically instituted the, health, the Clinton health plan with, with HMOs and, and uh, it's not exactly single payer, but it is a single collector. Um, and, and uh, HMOs, a lot like Kaiser Permanente, you know, publicly funded. It's a little like the um, Medicare Advantage plans where everyone's in a network, but the networks are supported and the money is collected by the government and it's paid out according to capitation uh, formula. I mean, I don't want to get into it too deeply, but the important thing is most people in Israel understand that the state gives you your health care, gives you your infant care, gives you your, um, your school system for free. The university system in Israel is very profoundly subsidized. Um, you know, uh, tuition, I think, is something like 15,000 to 20,000 shekels, which is like $8,000 or, uh, you know, six to $8,000 is tuition a year, which is sort of like Canada. It's, it's, it's that kind of thing. So the Israeli right is by no means um, going to uh, become cynical about the role of government. They're cynical about the role of the judiciary. <laughs> they want the judiciary out of the way, in part because they want the state apparatus to continue to support them without the with the, without the uh, judiciary getting involved and saying, you know, you can't actually give all this money to the um, religious school systems and not give it to the secular school system. That 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 notion of human dignity and equality is exactly the thing that the judiciary is in danger of doing, <laughs> as far as the right is concerned. Um, so, you know, I think, I think, you know, Steve Bannon could come to Israel and find, you know, the first five minutes when he talks about national, nationalism being important, he'd get your attention. But as soon as he tries, as soon as he would try to create a, a, a link to the um, drowning of government in a bathtub, that, that would not go very far. That would not go very far in Israel. I did want to ask you, uh, is, is Zionism still a thing? Because, you know, um, there is a Jewish state. The borders of it are, are essentially what I guess is in the Bible. I haven't read the Bible, but apparently it's, it's in the right. It's all, it's all there. And the, the moves into places like Gaza, which again, it's coming from the extreme right, is is not, it, it, it goes beyond Zionism. They're like super Zionist. Like they're not, they're not actually, 
they're they're betraying the yeah. original sort of yeah. goal here. Well, the religious Zionists think that the borders of Israel should be the biblical borders. Um, I don't think that people who come out of the labor Zionist tradition had a sense that those borders should be biblical. What, what would constitute the borders of Israel would be, where have we laid down Hebrew culture? And let's put a political border mm -hmm. around our cultural border. Um, the, the Zionist movement that actually built the country as the one that inherited the country, um, the Zionist movement that built the country always saw borders as being um, that which subtends the cultural achievement. And that's why they were willing to accept partition at various times, partition of the land, because basically they say, well, okay, we have our settlements here. Let's draw a border around where we are and give us self-determination where we are and where we're speaking Hebrew. Um, the original Zionists really did not have a, a strong attachment to Jerusalem. Um, in the 20s, going to Jerusalem was like going to archaic times. They didn't want to be part of that. There were ultra-Orthodox living in Jerusalem who embarrassed the original Zionists. They were in their shorts, on their, mm -hmm. you know, on if they could afford a tractor, on their tractor, um, you know, plowing up the land, getting suntanned, um, living um, with... Uh, a conception of, of Jewish emancipation, i.e. Hebrew cultural emancipation and women's emancipation, etc. And in Jerusalem, you had these ultra-Orthodox communities that the Zionists thought of as a kind of nature preserve. So they, they don't, so, so the question of whether Zionism is still a thing. If you're a religious Zionist, it's still a thing in the sense that they have not yet created the theocracy in the in the biblical border that was always their dream palace. But the um, the original Zionists, I think, understand that the word Zionism is a kind of keep out sign to the Arabs of the country, most of whom have really assimilated into this Hebrew cultural thing. Again, not give up their Arabic world, not give up Islam, but they have assimilated into this Hebrew cultural thing. I have friends um, in the Arab community who recognize that the Hebrew emancipation that they are living in gives them a chance to talk about sex, talk about their parents in ways that are uh, much more free than they were in their own culture prior to the coming of the state of Israel. Um, talk about democracy and freedom in ways that are not second nature in Islamic countries. And um, so, do you keep the keep out sign? Do you keep the keep out sign? I think if you're a liberal in Israel, you look at Zionism with a great deal of affection because you think of Zionism as having created this Hebrew national thing, this Hebrew reality, this cultural adventure. Uh, you, you, you think about walking down the main street of Tel Aviv, you know, uh, Rothschild Boulevard and and looking at all the businesses and cafes and young families and the strollers and you think this is this is a wonderful place this is something that was created um, and uh, you think of Zionism as having laid the foundations of that through sacrifice and sweat and socialist ideals and you want to build on that um, Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean you want to call yourself a Zionist, except in the kind of loose way people will use it to say I'm a patriot. You know, it's like saying I'm a minute man, <laughs> you know, or something like that. It's like, 
I'm, I'm, I'm a patriot, I'm a Zionist. Well, then the Arabs, I've had Arab friends say to me, you know, when they're at the demonstrations and they say that they're Zionists, it, it feels, it's like they have to tweak that. They have to tweak that. That, that, yeah. <laughs> that feels uncomfortable for me. I, I see this sea of, of Israeli flags and I think, well, is that really the place for me? So Israelis in the liberal world have to create um, a, uh, uh, a way of saying welcome to the Arab minority, either by inviting Arab speakers to speak, I mean, Israeli Arab speakers to speak at these, at these right. demonstrations, which they're doing increasingly and very self-consciously. Um, and finding ways of creating symbols of unity that don't sacrifice the Hebrew national achievement, but allow it to be inclusive enough as it was meant to be so that others could assimilate into it the way Jews might have assimilated into England or France or Germany at the turn of the 20th century. You know, that, that, was, that was the Zionist ideal in the first place. So I think in some sense, the liberals are recognizing that they're in a, a kind of post-Zionist reality and uh, they don't need the word anymore. It's not, they don't have to call themselves post-Zionist because that's like, a, that's, that's, that can be too, um, I don't know, unnecessarily hostile to people for whom the word has great sentimental value, but, but, mm -hmm. but they don't need it. They don't need the word. Uh, they should be focused and are increasingly focused on Israeliness and uh, democratic Israeliness. And everybody understands that there was a Zionist movement that produced this. Oh, and then I, I also just wanted to go back to something I had asked you very quickly, is that when I was asking about Netanyahu and sort of palling around with these these. Yeah. Like right wing call yeah. cost and I was when I, I I mean I meant to I meant to not suggest that he's literally working in league with them, but that you know by association he is giving them a legitimacy and sort of answer preemptively answering the question yeah. a critic would have in that oh this person is an anti semite this person is a Holocaust denier and saying no 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 Netanyahu's friends with him they they work together they're fine so that was that I just wanted to clarify yeah. that point and it does, if so does that change your answer no, at think, all or is I it, think you're, just... it, you're right to raise this Netanyahu has been very cynical in the way that he's affiliated with leaders in Europe particularly in central and eastern Europe who have let's say sketchy um, credentials with regard to the Jews and who themselves are arguing for a kind of nationalism in which the Jews don't exactly fit. Um, so that cynicism is definitely there. And he's, you know, Netanyahu is basically saying something like, yes, we're that way too. And if the Jews of Hungary, if there are any left, you know, I mean, in some sense, we're talking about Hungary and Poland, um, where where there are not a great many Jews left, uh, to you know, tragically, to our horror, um, there most were murdered by the Nazis. So it's not like, you know, it's not like Netanyahu is making common cause with people whose own Jewish communities are big enough to be, in some ways disrupted by this palling around. Uh, but of course, Netanyahu believes that if, you know, they want to come to Israel, you know, the door is open to them, that he kind of assumes that that's mm -hmm. the case. But I'll say something else. More interesting than his relationship with Orban is his relation to American evangelicals who, who oh, yeah. <laughs> think that the Jews are basically gathered in Israel in order to uh, prepare for the second coming. Yeah, it's a kickstart. You got to put all the Jews in one place, and then that's you right. Got you your got rapture. your rapture. Jesus, because like it's 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 so. I mean, I I grew up in Iowa around a lot of evangelicals, and also you know yeah. other denominations of Christians who have that very cynical right. approach. So you know, there's some of the worst anti-Semites. Exactly. 
I've ever met. But of course, they're they're very much like, no, Israel is good. Everything Israel does is good. We cannot I, question it. You know what? It's, it's, they're terrible it's hard not to. They believe in sort of turn or burn, as somebody once put it to me. Um, uh, but yeah. they are very close to, guess who? The settlers, the right-wing settlers, the people mm -hmm. who are going to occupy the biblical lands because that's those are the lands that the evangelicals know from the bible and they think it's the most natural thing in the world that the prophecies say that the jews will return to their biblical lands and that will create the foundation for an eventual um, armageddon that will lead to mm -hmm. uh, the second coming of christ and and you know that those are the people that Netanyahu has been cultivating and the settlers have been cultivating much more so than the uh, mainstream Jewish organizations in America, most of whom, I mean, don't forget Israel, you know, American Jews are 80% either liberal, Democrat, and or reform congregations mm -hmm. who have a great deal of antipathy for the kind of Orthodox cult that you have in Israel and, um, or that you might have in parts of Brooklyn. And, uh, yes. you know, the fact that Netanyahu is cultivating these relations is very embarrassing to American Jews. Netanyahu has not been cultivating them. He knows better. He's been cultivating the evangelicals more. And um, this is, uh, kind of an even greater danger, I think. Yes, absolutely. I would absolutely agree with that, having had firsthand experience yeah. with these people. <laughs> it's a greater danger and a greater act of yeah. cynicism, an even greater act of cynicism yes. than, um, you know, flying out and being on a red carpet with Viktor Orban. Um, mm -hmm. we, we, we haven't paid that piper yet uh, but I mm -hmm. fear that it's going to be a very um, very uh, polarizing thing in the American Jewish community going forward um, but you know uh, American Jews have will have to deal with their own problems you fight for That's democracy right. wherever you stand it's such a you know, democracy is such an anomaly. It's such an anomaly. It's such an achievement. Yes. Um, it, it's so, it so uh, cuts against human nature in a way to be free like that. It's so much easier mm -hmm. to, to go along with revealed wisdom and to confuse the country with your family and to live under the protection of a strong leader and not to have to think about quantitative easing. Um, you know, democracy yeah. is really tough to sustain. And, um, you know, I think uh, the Israeli right has proven that that's a universal problem. Yeah, there are definitely a lot of people in the U.S. pushing for some sort of variation on feudalism, except for there's like cool technology. <laughs> so it's been <laughs> it's been a little grim, I must say. But again, I think you know, as you as you said, these there are these grassroots movements that are bubbling up, and they you know the the real leaders, the people's the people whose names we will know have yet to to rise, but they they almost certainly will. Yeah. I no, hope. they will. They will. <laughs> they hope. will. We're, you know, they may, we may not win, but there will be a new leadership. Well, thank you so much. This was really wonderful. You've been listening to the Harper's Magazine podcast, produced by Violet Luca and Madeline Crum, with production assistance by Ian Montgani. The music is Cut and Shoot by Febrifuge. 
Harper's Magazine is the oldest general interest monthly in America, exploring the issues that drive our national conversation through long-form narrative journalism and essays. To get 12 issues for $21.97, visit harpers.org slash save.